So this lecture is part of an online mathematics course on group theory and will be about the quaternion group and the quaternions. So just recall from last lecture, we had a quaternion group with eight elements, plus or minus one, plus or minus i, plus or minus j, plus or minus k. And these satisfied the relations i, j equals k, j, k equals i, k, i equals j, and i squared equals j squared equals k squared equals minus one. And you can represent the elements of this group as matrices. So we can put i equals i minus i, j equals 1 minus 1, and k equals i i. And of course, 1 is just represented by the matrix, the identity matrix, and minus 1 by that. Um, and uh, we can actually form um, a ring of quaternions. So what we do is we take all matrices of the form A plus B I plus C J plus D K with A, B, C and D real. So this is isomorphic to R to the four, a four dimensional vector space with coordinates A, B, C and D. And we can define a ring multiplication on it using these rules. Notice this multiplication isn't commutative because um, I, J is minus J, I, J, K is minus K, J, and K, I is minus I, K. So you sometimes get minus signs whenever you change the order of things. So this ring was discovered by Hamiltonian and is called the ring of Hamiltonian quaternions. The, the, the term quaternion means a group of four things. Um, Hamilton may have got it from the from the Bible where it says when Herod arrested St. Peter, he delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers. And a quaternion of soldiers is just a, is just a group of four soldiers. Um, if, if you want to see this, you have to use an old Bible because modern Bible is just translated as a squad of soldiers or something boring like that. But anyway, um, quaternions are a sort of analog of the complex numbers. And a lot of things you can do with complex numbers, you can do with quaternions. So you remember complex numbers, you just have things a plus b i with a and b real. And we just have i squared equals minus one and there aren't any j's or k's. And what you can do with a complex number is you can take its complex conjugate. So the complex conjugate of a plus b i is a minus b i. And we know that um, if z is a complex number, then z times its complex conjugate, um, let's put z equals a plus b i, is a squared plus b squared, which is always greater than or equal to zero. And this can be called the norm of the complex number z, and it has the properties that norm of z1, z2 is the norm of z1 times the norm of z2. So the norm of z is just the square of its absolute value. And you can do exactly, almost exactly the same thing for the quaternion. So if a quaternion is a plus b i plus c j plus d k, then we set its complex, con its not complex conjugate, quaternion conjugate to be a minus b i minus c j minus d k. And again, we find z times z bar is equal to a squared plus b squared plus c squared plus d squared, which is greater than or equal to zero. And you may think when you multiply z by z bar, you're going to get all these funny cross terms involving i times j. But these all cancel out because here you've got an i times j, and here you've got an j times i, and i j plus j i is zero, so they cancel out. So, and again, you can check if, if you define this to be the norm of z, the norm of z1, z2 is the norm of z1 times the norm of z2. And you've got to be a bit careful about proving this because quaternions are not commutative. So if we find the norm of z1, z2 is equal to z1, z2 times z1, z2 bar. And now 
conjugation has the property that z1 z2 bar is equal to z2 bar z1 bar and you should notice here that there's a change in order so this is fairly easy just to check explicitly anyway using that we see that this is z1 z2 z2 bar z1 bar and now we've got a z2 z2 bar and z2 z2 bar is a it's a it's a real multiple of one so it commutes with everything so this is now z1 z1 bar z2 z2 bar which is norm of z1 norm of z2 um well what can we do with this well if you've got the complex numbers then the complex numbers of absolute value one um which, which is the same as saying the norm is equal to one form a circle um, s1 and this is a group so using the complex numbers you can see the circle s1 is a group under um, because we can just identify it as complex numbers of absolute value one and use complex multiplication we can do the same thing for the quaternions we take the quaternions with norm of z equals one or well, the absolute value of z equals one because of course the absolute value of a quaternion is just defined to be the square root of its norm um, and these are the solutions of a squared plus b squared plus c squared plus d squared equals one so it's a sphere s3 so s3 is also a group um, and this is kind of well, you, you may think maybe all spheres are groups, but in fact, it's very rare for a sphere to be a group. The only spheres that are groups are S0, S1, and S3. So S0 is the things of norm um, Z equals 1 in R. So it's just the group of two elements. Um, plus or minus one naught dimensional sphere is just two points this is the things of norm one in c and this is the things of norm one in the hamiltonian quaternions um, and of course this is a non-commutative group whereas these two groups are commutative um, So Hamil one of the reasons Hamilton was very interested in quaternions is that they give a very easy way to define rotations in three-dimensional space. And Hamilton actually spent a lot of time trying to rewrite all of physics um, in terms of quaternions using this. Um, yeah, people rediscover quaternions and Clifford algebras about every 10 or 20 years or so and get very excited about them. The latest incarnation is called geometric algebra but anyway so how can we have um how can we use quaternions to describe rotations in three-dimensional space what we do is we make three-dimensional space equal to the set of quaternions of the form bi plus cj plus dk so these are the sort of imaginary quaternions where we where we don't where, where we take the real part a of the quaternion to be zero um, and um, suppose we take a vector v in r3 and suppose we take a, a quaternion g in s3 thought of as a subset of the quaternions then you can see that g v g to the minus one is also in r3 this is quaternion multiplication Um, and moreover, it preserves length because the norm of g v g to the minus one is equal to the norm of v because it's um, the norm of g times the norm of g to the minus one is just one. And the norm of v is just the square of its length. So this actually preserves lengths. So um, um, it, it also preserves parity. So this is actually a rotation. of three-dimensional space. If you 
do this transformation, you get a rotation. Um, th this is actually, um, turns out to be very useful in computer games of all things, because 3D computer games involve large numbers of rotations as you're changing your point of view and so on. And the obvious way to represent rotations is, is as three by three matrices. Um, well, a three by three matrix has nine entries, um, but you can instead represent rotations as a quaternion, and this only uses four entries. And furthermore, multiplication of quaternions is more efficient than multiplication of three by three matrices. So if you represent rotations by quaternions, it sort of slightly speeds up your computer game. Um, well, you may think this means that S3 is the group of rotations of three-dimensional space. Well, that's not quite true. What we get is we get a homomorphism from S3 onto the group of rotations of three-dimensional space. This means the special orthogonal group of dimension three over the reals, which are just three by three orthogonal matrices. They're, they're just, as you remember from linear algebra, these represent rotations in R3. Well, it turns out this group has a non-trivial kernel, and the kernel is the group of order two consisting of plus or minus one. You can see if G is plus or minus one, then this is just equal to V. And it's not difficult to check that conversely, if G, V, G to the minus one is equal to V for all V, then the only possibility is G is plus or minus one. And what we have here is called a double cover of SO3 of R. Um, double covers of groups are actually quite common in mathematics. So a, a double cover is a group mapping onto this group here whose, whose kernel is order two. And, well, a, a trivial way of getting a double cover would just be to take the product of SO3 with a, the group of order two. But this is a different double cover uh, and a much more interesting one. Um, it's um, actually obligatory at this point to demonstrate the soup plate trick in order to illustrate this double cover. So let me try and do that. Um, so the soup plate trick involves taking a soup plate like this, and you imagine it full of soup. This isn't actually full of soup, but you pretend it is. So it has to be held upright. And for some weird reason, you wish to rotate the soup plate by 360 degrees anti-clockwise. So you do it like this. And if you rotate it by 360 degrees anti-clockwise, not very surprisingly, your arm gets a 360 degree twist in it. So I'm going to rotate it by another 360 degrees anti-clockwise. And you expect your arm is now going to get a double twist in it, but instead the twist kind of disappears. So what does this have to do with the um, double cover of SO3? Well, uh, oh, here we go. Um, well, this, uh, the group SO3 of rotations represents possible positions of the soup plates. I mean, you, 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 you can rotate the soup plate by any element of SO3. So SO3 is something to do with the positions of the soup plate. And this extra factor of plus or minus one is, is a group of order two and corresponds to the fact that you can have a 360 degree twist in your arm while holding the soup plate. But if you do two 360 degrees, then, then, this, uh, then, then the square of this element is one. So that twist in your arm sort of disappears. Um, so another application of this is this group here is actually called by physicists the spin group. And it turns up quite a lot in quantum mechanics. So in quantum mechanics, um, if you look at the space of possible wave functions of a particle, you might expect that it's acted on by rotations of three-dimensional space. This is doing non-relativistic quantum mechanics. But it turns out that quite often this doesn't quite work. Um, that works fine for the particles called bosons, which have integral spin. 
but there are particles like electrons, which are called fermions, which have half interval spin, and you discover that these particles are actually acted on by this group here. So this double cover sort of underlies the fact that um, um, electrons exist, and we wouldn't exist if this double cover didn't exist. Um, well, there's another rather useful thing you can do with this double cover. What we can do is use another sheet. Um, we take this double cover, one goes to plus or minus one, goes to S3, goes to SO3, R goes to one. And now inside SO3, we can take some sort of finite group of rotations. Well, you could, there are some rather uninteresting groups of rotations like cyclic groups, but the three most interesting finite groups of rotations are, as everybody knows, the group of rotations of these platonic solids. So we can take the tetrahedral, octahedral, or icosahedral group. So we could have, um, in particular for platonic solids, we get these groups of order 12, 24, and 60. Well, what we can do is we can take the inverse images of these groups in S3. So here we now get groups of order 24, 48, and 120. These groups here are called the binary tetrahedral, octahedral, and icosahedral groups. And um, they're all double covers of these groups here. Um, for example, we have a map one goes to plus or minus one goes to this group of order 120 to this group of order 160 to one, where this is the icosahedral group and this is the um, double cover of the icosahedral group called the binary icosahedral group. And the obvious question is, is this group just a product of the icosahedral group with a group of order two? And the answer is it isn't. The point is S3 has only two, has, has only one element of order two, which is the element minus one. And this is easy to see because if Z squared, if Z has order two, then Z squared equals one. Z is in S3, so Z, is, Z times Z bar is also equal to 1. And these two equations imply Z equals Z bar. That means Z must be a real, must be a multiple of A. So Z is just equal to A for A real. And since Z squared equals 1, we find A equals plus or minus 1. So S3 is only one element of order 2. Well, obviously, that means this group here has only one element of order two, which is this element here. And if it was the product of this group by this group here, it would have lots of elements of order two because the icosahedral group has loads of elements of order two. So we found some central extension of the icosahedral group, which is not a product of the icosahedral group with plus or minus one. Um, we'll be talking more about this group later when we get to groups of order 120. Um, I just mentioned briefly that quaternions can not only be used to describe rotations of three-dimensional space, they can also be used for four-dimensional space. Um, so I'll just briefly say what we do. So we identify four-dimensional space with the set of all quaternions, A plus B, I plus C, J plus D, K. And now suppose we've got two elements, G in S3 and H in S3. Now, if we take a vector in R4, we can map V to G, B to H, or possibly H to the minus one. And um, for any G and H, this turns out to be um, an element of SO4 of R, um, it's easy to check it preserves the norm because these both are norm one, so, it, so it's, it's a rotation. So this gives us a map from the group S3 times S3 
2SO4 of R, and it's not difficult to check it's on to. And as you can probably guess, this map isn't injective. It's got a kernel of order 2 um, consisting of the element that's minus 1 in both of these, because if you multiply V by minus 1 on the left and the right, then we get um, um, the, the identity map. So SO4 of the reals turns out to be isomorphic to S3 times S3, quotiented out by a group of order two. Um, so the next lecture, we will be talking about um, a bit more about the dihedral group and, um, and we'll prove and, and we'll use Burnside's lemma in order to count orbits of um, a group on a set.